In this lecture, we're going to look at the branches of the internal iliac artery. We're going to look at the branches that come off this internal iliac artery, which is a branch itself from the common iliac. We'll look at some of the divisions, the anterior and posterior divisions, and we'll look at the visceral and parietal branches that supply the organs within the pelvis and also the body wall, the walls of the pelvis. We'll look at some specific organs, so we'll look at the male reproductive organs, include the testes. We'll look at the female reproductive organs like the uterus and the vagina and the specific branches that supply them. And then at the end, we'll look at the rectum, which has a complicated blood supply. And we'll start looking at the blood supply to it with the upper, middle and lower parts. But important, remember that the rectum also with the anus runs in the perineum. And we'll look at that later on in the course. So the main arterial supply to the pelvic viscera is primarily from the internal iliac artery. And this artery gives rise to a complex and incredibly variable network of arteries that supply organs within the urinary, reproductive and gastrointestinal systems. Those systems that are located in the pelvis. So if we look at the general arrangement of the branches of the internal iliac, then on the screen we can see a hemisected pelvis which has had the organs removed. So we're just looking into a right hemisected pelvis. You should be familiar with this view now. Here we have, here we have the posterior aspect, here we have the anterior aspect. We can see we've got the sacrum, we've got the fifth lumbar vertebra here, we've got the pubic symphysis, but the bladder, the rectum, the uterus, the vagina have all been removed. And what you should be able to remember is that running down through the abdomen was the abdominal aorta, giving rise to those unpaired visceral branches that supplied the foregut, midgut and hindgut, the celiac trunk, superior mesenteric artery and inferior mesenteric artery. And then as it entered into the pelvis, the aorta, which we can see here, bifurcated into two. It bifurcated into the left, which we can see here that's being cut, and the right common iliac artery. And this occurred at around about the level of the fourth lumbar vertebrae, so about here. If we now just follow the right common iliac, which we can see running down here, we see the right common iliac itself divides into two. It divides into an external iliac and an internal iliac. Now, we'll concentrate on the internal iliac, but it's just worth remembering that the external iliac passing down in this direction will go on to form the femoral artery and supply the lower limb, but also coming up from the external iliac artery, we have the inferior epigastric artery. And remember, the inferior epigastric artery was important in providing arterial blood to the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall. It would go on to anastomose with the superior epigastric artery, which was a branch from the internal thoracic artery in the chest. So try to remember that formation of that collateral circulation. But let's just concentrate on the internal iliac artery. So here we can see the internal iliac that's passing down over the pelvic brim into the pelvis. And what we can see is that we have a whole series of branches. And in the cadaver, these branching patterns are incredibly variable. But they do tend to divide themselves into what's known as an anterior division and a posterior division. So let's have a look. We can see that running down this internal iliac artery here, we have an anterior division, which we can make out here, and we have a posterior division, which we can see here. The anterior division and the posterior division. Now these are going to give rise to numerous parietal and visceral branches. Parietal branches that will go and supply the body wall and visceral branches that will supply the organs. It's important to remember that we have these ovarian arteries and these arteries, remember, are coming from the aorta. And although the ovaries are located within the pelvis, 
These structures within the pelvis are not supplied by the internal iliac. They're supplied with the ovarian arteries. And these run within the suspensory ligament that we've spoken about, and they originate from the abdominal aorta. As we'll see, there may be some anastomoses with the uterine artery. These arteries tend to be paired. We tend to have both of them on the left side and on the right side. And also within the pelvis, we can have what are known as unpaired arteries. And these don't tend to come from the um, internal iliac artery. What we tend to have is a median sacral artery, and that's running directly down from the aorta. So we have the median sacral artery. We can see that running down in this direction. The name median gives it away that it's an unpaired artery. And we also have a superior rectal artery. The superior rectal artery is the direct continuation of the inferior mesenteric artery into the pelvis. It can divide into numerous branches that will descend either side of the rectum and anastomose with middle and inferior rectal arteries we'll explore later. But it's primarily an unpaired artery that comes from the inferior mesenteric. So that's a general overview of what we're looking at. And now let's go on to explore the branches of the internal iliac artery. So let's start off. We've got a cartoon here on the screen. And we've also got this flow diagram, which is showing the high level of complex arterial branches that are coming from the internal iliac. If we start with the posterior division, we can see that it's only giving rise to these three branches. And this really can depend on what, say, textbook you use to look at when you're revising or what resource, because most resources will comment on posterior and anterior divisions, but not all of them will say the same arteries are found in the anterior or in the posterior division. And I personally don't think it matters. I think it's important to understand the arteries and where they've come from, where they go to, but the actual specific details of whether it comes from a posterior division or an anterior division, I'm personally not sure that makes a massive difference. Being able to locate them and say what they supply is the key here, really. So let's concentrate on the posterior division. We have three important arteries, an iliolumbar artery. If we follow the common iliac, we then follow the internal iliac, and we have this posterior division here. We can see it gives rise to three branches. Iliolumbar artery, which we can see here, a lateral sacral artery, we can see here, and then it terminates by passing out of the pelvis superior to piriformis muscle through the greater sciatic foramen, remember we spoke about that a few lectures ago, as the superior gluteal artery. This doesn't actually supply anything in the pelvis, it passes out to supply the gluteal region, the musculature in the gluteal region. So the posterior division has these three branches, iliolumbar, lateral sacral, and superior gluteal, and we can see these branches here. The more complicated division is the anterior division, and we can see the anterior division is coming down in a more anterior direction, so we can see it coming down here. The anterior division will give rise to a couple of arteries, first of all, these being the umbilical and the obturator artery. If we follow the obturator artery around here, that is going to go and supply the medial compartment of the thigh supplies the medial compartment of the thigh, and it exits the pelvis by passing through the obturator canal. That is an aperture in the obturator fascia, which fills the obturator foramen. So we've got the obturator foramen here. We have a little deficit in this top corner here, and that allows obturator artery to pass through. Also passing through will be obturator nerve and obturator vein. And these go on to supply the medial compartment of the thigh, the adductor compartment. We then have the umbilical artery. The umbilical artery is important as we were developing, as this returned blood back to the fetus, back to the placenta. If you remember that the fetus received blood via the umbilical vein, via the umbilical cord from the placenta, which ran in the free edge of the falciform ligament. 
the blood that's then circulated through the fetus then returns to the placenta via these two umbilical arteries. And they then run up within the anterior abdominal wall. And you may remember when we looked at the anterior abdominal wall, there were some ridges on the posterior surface of the anterior abdominal wall. If you look back, you may remember the medial umbilical ligament, and that is where these umbilical arteries were running. Obviously, when we're born, we lose that connection with the placenta, and this umbilical artery becomes obliterated. It becomes fibrosed because blood no longer passes through it. However, it, all of it does not become fibrosed, and there is still a patent part, the patent portion of the umbilical artery, that runs towards the bladder, where it gives rise to these superior vesical arteries. These superior vesical arteries, here we can see the umbilical artery, that will become obliterated, but it's giving rise to two, three, four superior vesical arteries that run towards the top superior surface of the bladder. So this is an important um, artery to be aware of, the umbilical artery. We have two umbilical arteries, one coming here from the right, we have another one on the left, internal iliac. And they're in the fetus responsible for returning blood back to the placenta. When we're born, they become fibrosed, but it doesn't all become fibrosed, not in its entirety. And superior vesical arteries continue that pass to the bladder. Alongside having superior vesical arteries, we also have inferior vesical artery in the male, and that goes to supply the base of the artery, base of the bladder, I beg your pardon, inferior vesical artery. It gives prostatic branches that supply the prostate. It'll also give rise to the artery to the ductus deferens that runs alongside the ductus deferens, helping to supply it. In the female, this inferior vesical artery can be known as the vaginal artery, and it passes towards the vagina. We can also see that we have a uterine artery, and here in this diagram we can see a uterine artery that's passing towards the uterus in the female, and this uterine artery may itself give rise to a vaginal branch that helps to supply the vagina. We'll look at these in more detail when we look at the blood supply to the female organs specifically. Males don't obviously have a uterine artery as they don't have a uterus. We can then see that we have a few more arteries which can be quite variable in position or they may not actually occur. For example, here we've got a middle rectal artery. This is only present in about 60% of the population. Not everyone has a middle rectal artery. We have a superior rectal artery and we have an inferior rectal artery, which we'll see later. And these will form an anastomosis and that may be sufficient. But in about 60% of the population, you'll also find a middle rectal artery. The final two really are the bifurcating end of the internal iliac artery where it terminates and importantly both of these leave the pelvis by passing inferior to piriformis and pass out by the greater sciatic foramen. Now this is a really complicated but important part of this pathway for the internal iliac artery. These arteries leave the pelvis via the greater sciatic foramen. We can see them here. This is the greater sciatic foramen. Here we've got piriformis muscle, and we can see that superior gluteal left through the greater sciatic foramen, superior to piriformis. Internal pudendal and inferior gluteal will also leave through the greater sciatic foramen, but they're going to leave inferior to piriformis. So in the cadaver, if you're struggling to locate these arteries, find piriformis. Above will tend to be superior gluteal, and below will be inferior gluteal and inter internal pudendal. Now, the inferior gluteal will go to the gluteal region and supply the muscles of the buttock, gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, gluteus maximus, go and supply that region. Whereas internal pudendal will go to supply the perineum. And we'll look at this in more detail when we look at the perineum. But what we have is inferior gluteal passing out to the gluteal region and internal pudendal actually hooking around this structure here, which is the ischial spine, 
and connecting to the sacrum where we have the sacrospinous ligament. It'll hook around this structure and actually enter into the perineum by passing through the lesser sciatic foramen, this foramen here. So we can see the internal pudendal artery leaves the pelvis via the greater sciatic foramen. It then enters the perineum, which is located underneath the pelvic floor by passing through the lesser sciatic foramen. We'll look at that when we look at the perineum in more detail. Now let's move on to the individual branches in the male and the female that may be specific. Here in this diagram, we can see we have the bladder, we can see we have the seminal vesicles, we can have the ras deferens. If we look at the ras deferens, we can see running along here, we can see running alongside it, we have the artery to the ras deferens. So this is specifically found in the male where we have a ras deferens. We can see we have superior vesical arteries supplying the superior aspect of the bladder, and we can also see that we have inferior vesical arteries that are coming down and supplying the base of the bladder and also giving prostatic branches to supply the prostate. So this is what we find in the male. Here in this diagram we can also see we've got the superior rectal arteries running down on the lateral surface, either side on the lateral surfaces of the rectum. We can also see in this example we have a middle rectal artery and that's given rise just before the internal iliac dives out of the pelvis via the lesser sciatic foramen. I've included the testes here just to show the blood supply to the testes, but all I really wanted to mention is that we have the testicular artery. Remember the testicular artery comes from the aorta. It doesn't come from the internal iliac artery. So we've got the testicular artery which is going to supply the testes. But look, we can see here, we still have the artery to the vas deferens. Running along the vas deferens, that's then going to go towards the epididymis. So we can see there's the potential here for some kind of collateral circulation between the two systems, branches from the internal iliac and branches from the abdominal aorta. So that's a general overview of the branches of the internal iliac within the male. If we look at the female, then I've mentioned a few of these arteries before. Again, we have the idea that we've got the ovary here, we've got the ovary here, and we can see that we have the ovarian artery. Remember, the ovarian artery is coming up from the aorta. It's not coming from the internal iliac artery. And then we look at the specific branches that supply the uterus and the vagina from the internal iliac. Remember, we have the uterine artery. Here we can see the uterine artery supplying the body of the uterus, it will run within the broad ligament and form a collateral circulation, anastomosis, with the ovarian arteries. So again, there's the potential for links between the internal iliac and the aorta. We can see that we coming from the uterine artery, we have the vaginal branches, and these are supporting the vaginal artery. So here we can see the vaginal artery, this direct branch coming from the internal iliac. In the male, it's the inferior vesicle. In the female, it's the vaginal artery, and that's specifically going to supply the vagina. So here we can see the various branches in the female. Branches coming from the internal iliac, uterine artery, its vaginal branches, and the vaginal artery, and also branches coming from the aorta, where we have the ovarian artery. It's really important to remember that this uterine artery is positioned above the ureter. So if a lady was to have a hysterectomy, then when the uterus was removed, then you'd clamp off the uterine artery. If you didn't, and then you remove the uterus, you'd have bleeding out into the pelvis. So the relationship is that you've got the uterine artery, uterine artery, and coming down, you have the ureter that flows underneath this blood vessel. That's really important when you need to remove the uterus, that you clamp the uterine artery, and you can deal with it, you can ligate it, and you leave the ureter intact. How can you tell the difference between the ureter and the uterine artery? Well, the uterine artery will have this pulsatile 
contraction as the blood is passing through the uterine artery. And if you're the surgeon, you can just tap the ureter and that will stimulate a wave of peristalsis that will go in both directions, a direction back up to the kidney and a direction down to the uterus. So remember that the water within the ureter flows under the bridge, the bridge being the uterine artery. And that's an important consideration when looking at the blood supply to the female. And then finally, the final organ I want to concentrate on is the rectum, because this has quite a substantial blood supply coming from multiple sources. We can remember once again that the rectum is going to be supplied by branches from the inferior mesenteric artery, from the internal iliac, and as we'll explore when we look at the perineum, branches from the internal pudendal artery. What we've got here is a posterior view of the rectum, posterior view, and here we've got our ischial tuberosities we can see here moving up towards the ischiopubic rami, moving up towards the pubic symphysis. We can see we've got the sigmoid colon here, and we can see it's bending down to form the rectum. And what we can see coming from the aorta just before it bifurcates is the inferior mesenteric artery. The last branch really to come from the inferior mesenteric artery, the one that kind of runs closest down in the midline, is this one here, and that is your superior rectal artery. We can see the superior rectal artery dividing. Remember, it's an unpaired branch, the superior rectal. We just have one of them. But it does divide, it bifurcates into lateral branches that run down the lateral surface of the rectum. We can then see here, if we pick up the internal iliac which we can see here, the external iliac is going forwards, the internal iliac we can see here gives rise to the obturator artery passing through the obturator canal and it gives rise here to the, gives rise to the internal pudendal which we can see running down here. That as we'll come to recognize gives a series of branches that supply the anal canal region but what we're concentrating on is the potential for these 60 percent of the people to have this middle rectal that's going to pass down in this direction. You can see that there's a lot of connections between the middle rectal and the superior rectal and this is supplying the superior middle and potentially the lower portions of the rectum. But within the anal canal, which we'll look at in the perineum around here, we can see that's actually supplied by a branch coming from the internal pudendal. But the rectum up here is supplied by superior rectal and, if present, the middle rectal. So, this is just includes some of the notes of what I've just described. We have these three parts to the rectum, this proximal part, middle and inferior parts, all carried out by branches from the inferior mesenteric or the internal iliac artery. And it's this anorectal junction, this division here, here we can see the pelvic floor, which we'll look at in the next lecture, and everything inferior, superficial to the pelvic floor is going to be supplied by this inferior rectal artery which comes from the internal pudendal. And I think that's a good place to leave it because we'll look at that in lectures to come. So in this lecture we've looked at the anterior and posterior divisions of the internal iliac and their parietal and visceral branches. And then we've looked at the specific branches to the male reproductive structures and to the female reproductive structures like the uterine artery and its vaginal branch and the vaginal artery that supplies the uterus and the vagina. We then finish by looking at the rectum and how it has quite a diverse blood supply to its upper, middle and lower parts. And then really led on to a future lecture which is the inferior rectal arteries coming from the internal pudendal, which we'll come across again when we look at the perineum.